Lord, you are so good to us. You are good to us when we don't deserve it, when we don't expect it, when I don't expect it. You are so good and you remain good, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray that we would have joy, joy in you and that it would overflow from us, that we couldn't keep it in. And I pray that we can give you glory now as we read your word. And I pray that we'll take that and share it with others. And I pray that others will see your glory. I thank you, Lord. And all God's people said. Good morning. Please remain standing if you're able. We are going to I have the privilege this morning of reading with you um, in God's word. My name is Bryn Zebrack. And the scripture we'll be turning to today is Mark 11, chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. If you're using the Bible from the seat in front of you, you can find that on page 848. Mark 11, verses 27 through 33. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. All right, please be seated, and uh, we will now watch the weekly announcements uh, in this video. Good morning, MCC. My name is Nathan McQueen, and I am the Family and Youth Ministry Leader here at the church. I'd love to welcome you all this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to meet you after the service. Please head back to the Welcome Center. We have a free gift for you there. And since we're talking about the Welcome Center, here's a couple other items to mention. First is a free book, Gentle and Lowly. There are still a few copies there, and if you don't have one, please help yourself. Also, we're going to be starting an Advent devotional on Monday, November 29th. There are printed copies at the Welcome Center as well, so please stop by and grab one of those. Another thing for everyone to take note of are the connection cards that are in the seat in front of you. If you're new or a regular attender, please fill out as much information as you feel comfortable. There's also space on the back for any comments or prayer requests. If you're a parent, we also have multiple options for you and your kiddos. Please see an usher if you have any questions about our children's ministry or head upstairs if you'd like to take advantage of our parents' room. While you're up there, you'll see that we have the nursing room where you can go in, close the door, and have some privacy. If you'd like to watch the service from the other building, we also have the community room available every Sunday. And that's all for the announcements today. And now I would love to welcome up Glenna Sakers. Thank you, Nathan. Well, good morning, and I am Glenna Sifers, and I oversee the women's ministry here at Mill Creek Community Church. And I am happy to announce after two years of postponing that the ladies are going to have their ornament exchange and Christmas party. Okay. <laughs> And if you've never been before, um, you bring a $5 wrapped ornament, or you can make a homemade one. Those always go really well, too. We have dinner together, and then we exchange our ornaments. Um, it's just a great time of fun and fellowship, and it's a wonderful time to invite someone. So if you've been praying about your one, this would be a great time to invite that one. And if you'd like to attend, you can sign up on your response card, and that is December the 3rd at 6 o'clock. Now, I do have something that's even more exciting than the Women's Ornament Exchange Party. We have some, a couple that are going to be baptized this morning. So would you join me in welcoming Cliff and Raquel Palmer?
Good morning, guys. Today, Cliff and Raquel are coming to announce their faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, they will be given a baton that says invest. Uh, they are uh, committed to loving God, loving others, and making disciples. They also get a free towel from Leah, that lovely administrator right there. Dave uh, Zebrak, one of our servant leaders here, will be uh, baptizing Cliff, and then Cliff will get the privilege to baptize his life, wife, Raquel. So if you guys are ready, we'll go in and make your public profession. Let's go. Cliff will take a picture of you first there as you smile at Nathan. We'll have to turn you around there a little bit. There you go. <laughs> Cliff, is it your willingness announcement that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord? If so, say yes. Cliff, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You died with Christ and rose again with him. Okay, we'll do the same. We'll take a picture of you to remember. Raquel, is it your profession of faith today that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord? We now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You died with Christ and rose with him in your life. So we will leave the water in for this week. If you are wanting to be baptized, you've been praying about it, would you mark that on your card right in front of you or come and let one of us know and uh, we'll, we'll baptize you after a week. The water gets pretty stinky. So we want to see you come public uh, this week and soon. So let's pray together and give thanks. Father, thank you for putting us together here. Lord, uh, I'm excited for so many things. I often walk out of here on a cloud because you've put us together again in your presence and with your people as family. But thank you that part of your family has grown and that they, Cliff and Raquel, have publicly announced you and their faith. We pray that they'll love you deeply. They'll love others radically. And they'll make disciples as it's though their calling and passion, not uh, some duty. We pray, Lord, for those who will be reading the devotions, the Christmas devotionals this week and this month. We thank you for all the people in this building and the other two churches that wrote them. They did so in faith. So I pray you'll grow us this Christmas season. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for President Biden, that he would walk in righteousness or you would remove him. We pray for our town council, our leaders here in our town, our, our mayor. We pray for our governor. The same. You said unrighteousness will ruin a country, but righteousness will lift it up. So we pray they will walk in wisdom and righteousness. Lord, for people behind the scenes, they go to parents' meetings and school board meetings, and they uphold your calling to be faithful. We ask that you strengthen them. Father, thank you. And God's people said, amen. To those watching at home, we're in the book of Mark. We're in chapter 11. We are going through the last week of Jesus' life. And this is going to take us all the way to Easter. So this last week, we're going to really dig in and we talk about the prophecies he gives, the calling he gives to Israel, the call he gives to us. We talk about why 
some of the things are happening in the world. So this is, this is going to be good for us. We'll take December off uh, to talk about Christmas. So we'll have some Christmas messages in December. We're going to talk about Witnesses Majesty, which is what the devotionals are on. So when you pick that up or we'll send it to you in your inbox, it's, it's going to be a theme for that month to witness the majesty of Jesus Christ. But his majesty is never more on display than between two thieves. This is his greatest calling to come and die to buy back his people that the Father gave him before time began. That's not the way the world sees it until their eyes get open. Humanism is the greatest, biggest religion and biggest threat to Christianity in the world, not Islam or Mormonism. It's just pure humanism. I was reading from the theologian Sammy Hagar. He's on your screen. He used to, <laughs> he used to lead Van Halen. I don't know if he's still alive or if they're still together. That was way back in the day, but... I quote caught me, he said, I, I think too much emphasis is on the man himself. He, he, he goes in great detail that if Jesus were here, he would say, don't listen to me or don't look to me. Kind of like Buddha did. Buddha said, I'm not starting a religion, don't listen to me, don't look at me. He, he, he considers Jesus in the same way. If he were here today, he would go around, hey man, then exactly like that, hey man, don't be looking at me. He actually made it pretty easy on us. The rules are so simple, those Ten Commandments. Anybody in their right mind could live by those rules. I think that's all Christ was really trying to do. That's one part of humanism. You can tell he doesn't know the Ten Commandments or the depth of them. But that aside, his eyes haven't been opened. He, he says what humanism is all about is that we just need to try harder. We need to hear the rules, the basics of society, and just all try to get along and just try better. He, he's not into transformation of the heart. He's into doing the best we can with what we have. Do you think if we all tried harder that murders would disappear? Rape would go away? Racism would be gone? Slave trafficking would end? Gossip would stop if we just got together and tried harder. That's humanism. Another part of humanism is Greg Epstein, the first Harvard chaplain that was elected as an atheist, a chaplain who's an atheist. We don't look to God for answers. He said, We're, we are each other's answers. We can be good without God. That's another part of atheism or humanism is that you try hard and you'd be as good as you can be. No one really can qualify that term. When Jesus was asked about good, he said, why do you call me good? Are you calling me God? But the term is relative and thrown around a lot, but it's hard to explain except for that it seems to be the cure for most people. Let your goodness shine through and everything will be better if we just be the best people we can be. Interesting, John Harvard started Harvard University because of sin. One of the first major universities in America, almost all major universities were started by Christ followers. The name or the motto was for Christ and his truth in the church. He was concerned that pastors would not be equipped well and they would not deal with the problems that he already see, that he already saw coming up in the community and the new colonies and the new world. He wanted to present men of God who would know the word and present Christ Jesus. Now they've taken truth for Christ and the church down and we don't need anyone but ourselves. Do you think, just honestly, do you think if we were just as good as we could be, that murders would go away. Slave trafficking would disappear. Racism would be gone. Gossip would stop. Albert Einstein gives us one more aspect of humanism. The word God for me is nothing more than an expression and a product of human weakness. The Bible is a collection of honorable but still primitive legends which are nevertheless pretty childish. He says, if we just put our mind to it and use human intellect, we'd all get along better. 
One says we need to try more. One says we just need to be better people. The other says we need to use our minds. And we could solve the solutions of the problems like wars and human slave trafficking and gossip and poverty and other things. Do you believe that? That's humanism in its form that has come back and cycled over and over for thousands of years. We were driving to um, Cincinnati recently and there was police everywhere, 12, 13, 14 police. We just started counting them and it was amazing how many people would go from 70, speed limit was 70, to 60-ish. Not just slow down, but like almost hit the brakes. And um, I said a prayer over a few of them and, and uh, we, uh, we'd get going and get going again and then another policeman, we'd all slow down again. That's humanism. We're going to bring in some rules and some ways to do things, and, but there's no real transformation. No real long-term transformation. Jesus comes and you see him on a donkey. You're talking about weakness. This is weakness for weakness. He's dragging the ground, his feet are. He's on a little bitty colt. He's not on a huge horse. He's not on a conquering horse. He comes into Jerusalem because Zechariah said he would 500 years before this, that he would come in on the foal, a colt of a donkey. This is weakness for weakness. God's weakness for our weakness. That God who is strong, Paul said to the Corinthians, became weak so that we could be strong in his name. He is the absolute opposite of humanism. He says, I'm going to change your heart and your soul. I'm going to transform you from within. I'm going to put my spirit within you. Anyone who comes to me will not just be forgiven, but will be clean and pure and holy. Words we don't even hardly use anymore. He goes, you remember David, he preached such a great sermon last week. David has grown so much. And he, he talked about the, the Lord went in and turned everything up in the temple. He cleansed it. And he said to the people there, the people buying the stuff and selling the stuff, neither one of you want me. It's just a human effort baked in religion. You don't want me. You don't delight in me. You don't love me. And so he cleanses the temple. And he also cleansed the fig tree. And he went up to it and it had leaves but no fruit. And when you look at Israel at the time, they had a lot of leaves. They had sacrifices going on and, and hustling and bustling. It's the Passover week. A million plus people are there. All kinds of things are going on. It looks so good from the outside. It looks phenomenal. It looks busy. It looks religious. It looks good. And he says, none of it or very little of it is good because you don't love me. This is, a, this is a stunning, stunning declaration to Israel and to us. His greatest moment is between two thieves, and this is his last week. First, why does your children, spouse, my children, spouse, whoever it might be, my grandmother, grandfather, whoever you name, not come to the Lord? Well, first, because they reject the Lord's authority. It's not a problem with evidence. We must get this through our mind. It's not a problem with evidence. It's authority. It's authority. Mark eleven twenty seven. if you've got your Bible or it's on your note sheet. They, they came again to Jerusalem. He's walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders come to him. Here's their question. Here's what's on their mind. 28. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you authority to do them? That's their problem. That's anybody's problem who doesn't come to the Lord. They have an ultimate authority. Everyone here has ultimate authority. And they said, you're interfering with our authority to run our own lives. And who gave you that authority? It's ultimate authority, not evidence. It is interesting that the three branches of government have come together against him. These represent uh, everything in Jerusalem about the Bible, but about political government, the judges, the rulers, uh, the lawyers, they're all there. Three branches of government are there. They're all against each other for the rest of Scripture, but now they've combined together to be against him. Can you imagine today 
if you saw on TV President Trump, President Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and whoever, Congress, and they're all together saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe Snickers are good. I, maybe something like that. But it's not going to be any great thing that they're going to come together on. This, you might just, it's a small phrase. Don't go past it too quickly. They don't like each other. And they've come together. One group's extremely conservative. One group's extremely liberal. One believes in the resurrection. One doesn't. One believes in following Roman authority. One says all Romans should die. And they've gotten in the back room and they've come together and they've said, let's put our differences aside. Let's get rid of this man. He wants to turn our world upside down. Jesus came to turn your world upside down. Not take sides, but take over. He has come and they're clear about it. Matthew on your screen, 23 he has said, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children together like a hen takes in her chicks, but you were not what? If you go to heaven, people debate this all the time, right? All the doctrines, reform, Calvinism, Arminian, free will. Here's what the Bible says. If you go to heaven, God did it. If you go to hell, you did it. It doesn't even try to explain it. There is not free will, as we talk about, and there's not double election. But there is election, and there is human responsibility. And they look like two mountains that are wide apart, but in God's mind, they're side by side. Here's the deal. You go to heaven, God did it. You go to hell, you did it. You're responsible. You go to heaven, it's grace. You were not willing. Verse 38, your house is left to you desolate. That's an interesting word. It means deserted, uh, deep wilderness. It means abandoned, rejected, empty, no life, no life. He, he looks at them and he says, you want to know what's really inside you? Deserted, empty, unfulfilled, nothing. And you're busy doing it all day long. You're busy doing it all day long. Why does Albert Einstein, why did he not come to the Lord or Greg Epstein or your daughter or your son or a person you love that you're praying for? Because they are rejecting his authority. They want to be boss of their own life. By the way, the book of Revelation says this is going to happen at the end of time. All branches of governments everywhere will come together against the Lamb of God. Not against Allah or Muhammad or Buddha, but against the Lamb. In Luke 16, there's this scene that goes with this, and they're wondering why there's not this mass revival since the Messiah is here. And Jesus looks at them and he says, even if one were raised from the dead, they will not believe. You often hear people say, well, if I could just see a miracle, you know, I'd believe. No. No, you wouldn't. If your heart is hardened, it's hardened. He said, even if they see a, one raised from the dead, they, they won't believe until God gets hold of their heart. That's not our job. We call him, we pray, we ask, we ask him to do his work. Look at Mark 1.22, just how he lived with authority among them for three years. 1.22, they were astonished at his teaching. He taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. He had taught clearly and boldly and by the power of the Spirit. And they still weren't convinced. I can't convince anyone. Neither can you. The best teacher who ever walked the earth. When he leaves... And he ascends to heaven. There's only 120 people in the upper room who are following him. Only God can create a revival. Why he does at sometimes and doesn't at others, I don't know. But I know this, God has to work on the hardened heart. He taught with authority. Did you see last week where the pastor in Tennessee went down, grabbed the man with the gun, man came up with a gun, waving it around, so he's going to kill people. The pastor comes down, tackles him. 
saves dozens of people. That's how Jesus taught with authority. He didn't just teach. He didn't just speak. He showed. He touched lepers. He touched prostitutes. He held people that hadn't been held in years. He spoke to people that people wouldn't speak to. He, he took people in his life that no one else loved. That's what it means to teach with authority. It means to speak and show the gospel. And that's how we've built a gospel culture here. That's how God has built a gospel culture here. You, many of you, you know it's more than just speaking. It's showing with your life that you love people. He taught with authority. Number seven, the second way he taught with a, or he went about with authorities, he removed evil spirits. Look at Mark 127. They were all amazed, saying, with authority, he commands even the evil spirits, and they obey him. He removed demonic spirits from people, convulsing, wallowing, and he removed them, and he, and he healed them, and the people watching still wouldn't believe. They thought the wrong people were being transformed. People who didn't deserve grace. People who had gone too far. Too many affairs. Too many murders. Too much junk. They'd gone too far. It was the wrong people being healed. In the gentle and lowly book that is back in the back for free. He, chapter 2 he says that's a common characteristic of Jesus, that he heals and releases those that he, quote, shouldn't. The society says you shouldn't. It's not fair. It says when Jesus expels demons and heals the sick, he is driving out of creation the powers of destruction. He's restoring created beings who are not only hurt, but they're sick in their heart. The lordship of God to which these healings give witness, it restores creation back to health. Jesus' healings are not so much supernatural miracles in a natural world. That's the way we tend to see them. It's not so much supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only natural thing about the kingdom of God where he comes in an unnatural, demonized world, a wounded world, and sets it straight. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. You know what they do? Did you see that um, earlier when we read it? They go ask him, where's your ordination papers? What, what synagogue laid hands on you and ordained you? Forget the miracles and the way you teach and all that stuff. Who laid hands on you and affirmed you and ordained you? Show us your papers. He said, I, I will never give you any papers. The Father has given me authority. They're not motivated to live under his authority. What happens to people like Cliff and Raquel when they come to Christ and get baptized and go public for Jesus Christ and they say, he's our ultimate authority? Well, John 20, uh, 28, he said, Thomas said, let's read it. You ready? You are my Lord and my God. We began to publicly speak of him. We were not ashamed of him. We began to speak openly about him. We began to tell people, here's who he is, and here's what he's done. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, those who yield their life. Paul said, we don't preach ourselves. That word means proclaim. We don't make life about ourselves. But we make it about Christ Jesus as Lord we are your bond servants. That's the lowliest of servants, the one who cleaned the bedpans, the one who did everything no one else would do. We're your bond servants for Jesus' sake. Well, when you give your life to him as your ultimate authority, you begin to serve him freely. You begin to speak of him openly, but you begin to serve him freely. You don't have to have applause or we don't have to have recognition. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, those who give him ultimate authority over their life, they, they can't say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We begin to live spirit-led lives. We begin to speak of him, serve him, and live spirit-led lives. 
Glenn Youngkin, you heard him this week, he became the governor of Virginia, openly, openly said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and I'm filled with his spirit. They released his taxes. I thought it was interesting, uh, all the people that are fighting right now not to release their taxes, I won't mention their names, it's not a political thing, there's several of them. He said, sure. He's given 40% of his income away the last five years. They asked him about it, and he said, who wouldn't be generous who knows generous grace? Out in the open, he said that. That's what it's going to take. In political places, people serving coffee. People helping people serving in the church. People working on the floor of a plant. Open. Honest. Clear. Bold. That's what happens when you give your life to him. Do you know for sure that he has ultimate authority over your life? Has there ever been a time, a season, where you said, I'm yours? In your own words, forgive me of my sins, but I'm yours. I can give my life to you. Come and live in me. Change me. Maybe you say that right now. Say it and mean it. Tell someone. Go public. Give him, give him the authority over your life. If you're like me, you probably know by now you've, you've not done a really good job being captain of your own ship. Second, people don't come to the Lord because we refuse to believe the truth. That is, the evidence is clear again. We reject his authority, but we refuse to believe his truth. Mark eleven twenty nine. 29, he continues, Jesus said to them, I'll just ask you one question. They want his ordination papers? He said, that's fine. Now remember, there's thousands of people around him. And so when he calls the leaders out, people would have said, whoa, let's listen to see what happens here. And he says, I just got one question for you. Was John the Baptist from God Almighty, was his ministry blessed by God or not? And they discuss it, verse 31. In other words, that means they huddled up. So they said, hold on, wait just a minute. And they go over to the side and they huddle up. They huddle up, they talk about it, and they say, well, if we say it was from God, from heaven, uh, we're in trouble. And if we say it's not, the crowd's going to crush us. They don't, have enough, they don't have enough boldness to even take a stand. They're just bullies, spiritual bullies. They, do, they don't deny the truth. Did you see that? They don't deny the truth. They just huddle up. They, they say, excuse us, we got, we got to talk. They don't deny the truth. They know the truth. They just don't want to believe it. Truth is clear. We, uh, we, I had to, we had to put one of our dogs down recently, and it, I took Piper to the vet, and it, it was a lot harder than I thought. I, it's, it's, she's a dog, right? I doesn't have a soul. I don't, at least, that, the way I see it in the Bible, we we're made in his image, dog's not. She may be in heaven, God may graciously uh, put her in heaven. There's some dogs there I own that I don't want in heaven, but she may be in heaven. <laughs> uh, vet, veterinarian comes in, very, very sweet lady. We talk about it, multiple, multiple issues, just not doing well. Uh, gives her an injection, goes out of the room, says, I'll give you a few minutes. Her breathing starts changing. Comes in the room, gives her another ejection, and she looks at me, the veterinarian does, she's checked her heart, she has a stethoscope, looks at me and says, she's gone. And she had to leave the room again, and I found myself shaking her. Like it wasn't, like it wasn't true. I've seen it a couple times when I'm with people, and they're, they've lost a loved one, and, and they'd reach over, and grab a hand and speak to them and ask them to speak back. We don't want to hear some things in life, especially if it means a lot to us. But the Lord takes it up a notch here. He says, there's some things that he, that he, you know, they're hard to hear. 
they're just hard to hear that someone's gone or someone's left or someone's not staying. They're hard to hear. But he takes it up a notch. Romans, on your screen, Romans 1, 18 and 19, the wrath of God, which means the righteous justice of God against murder, slave trafficking, gossip, hatred, racism. The righteousness of God is being revealed from heaven right now because people in their unrighteousness are suppressing the truth. You might want to circle that word. In unrighteousness, they're pushing down the truth. It's not just things they don't want to hear. It's that they want to live a certain life, and Jesus interrupts that life. In their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth, for what could be known about God is plain to them, because who showed it to them? God. Even if you didn't speak to them yet. So when I speak to someone, when you, when you live in front of them a Christ-like life, you double it. You triple it. They already know. God has made it plain to them. They're not suppressing the truth because it's hard to hear. They're suppressing the truth because they don't want to hear. In unrighteousness, they cannot be convinced without God. So I was telling my five-year-old granddaughter that uh, Piper, our dog, died. And our seven-year-old, who's been watching Dr. Paul, you know Dr. Paul, uh, she'd been watching Dr. Paul, so I say, well, Piper died. And she says, well, Papa, uh, really, she didn't die. You euthanized her. So <laughs> I, I, I said, I, I, which I said, can you spell that word? Can you, because can you, I don't know that I can. Uh, you, you, you put her down. You euthanized her. Yes, yes, I did. You know, we like to calm things down, don't we, about the truth. It's not a baby. It's a fetus. I didn't sin. I messed up. But the truth just keeps coming because God is wonderfully gracious. Wonderfully gracious. That's what makes the good news so glorious. God breaks through our rebellion and our suppression of the truth and wakes us up and brings us to life in Christ. Third, why do people not come to the Lord? Because we love the praise of people more than God. Look at somebody and just say amen. Just look at them right now and just say amen. 51% of Americans say they're afraid of snakes. 49% are lying. So that's, that's 51% <laughs> say they're afraid of snakes. About 85% say they're afraid of public speaking. But 100% of us are afraid of somebody else over God at some time in our life. We're afraid of people more than God. Demi Levito, I cleaned this song up. This is a, I think maybe a radio version, but cleaned it up. And I, I put her on here because she doesn't live the kind of life we live, but she knows. She knows what other people say. She wrote a song, co-wrote it with someone. She said, I used to not take chances with God's name. But it's been so long since I last prayed. Now I'm all messed up. My heart has changed because I care more about what other people say. That's, that's being authentic. Mark 11. Let's end this. Look, look, if you have not been in the Word yet, please look at the Word. 32. Shall we say that God, John's ministry is from man they were, say the next few words. Afraid of it don't matter. These people had PhDs. Most of them are extremely wealthy. They're honored, looked up to. They've got it made. They're still afraid of people. It don't matter who you are, how old you are, what, what you're doing. There's just times when we're more afraid of people than God. It's just human nature. It's part of the fall. They all held that John really was a prophet. The people did. Verse 33. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. That's a lie. Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. 
I was listening to a podcast, if you want to write these down, I was listening to a podcast, John Piper and some other people, I don't know who all was on it, but they said the problem with the fear of man is this, one is our identity. Somebody else settles our identity if we're afraid of them. If we, it means to fear, reverence, respect, not, not like cower down, fear, reverence, respect. If we give them the most reverence, respect, they settle our identity. Two, they settle our worth, if you write the word worth. They, they make us feel a certain way, whether we feel significant or not is usually from the people we fear. Third, we do what they want us to do, or we do what they, what they tell us to do, or we do what we watch. So we begin to do things because we fear them. And fourth, how we do it is decided by them. So our identity, worth, what we do, and how we do it is settled by who we fear, who we reverence. So here's the solution for these people in this passage and for you and for me in this building and for every person, every seven billion something that walks on the earth. Here's the solution. Walking in the fear of the Lord is living in a continual state of love, respect, and reverence for God and for his name. And if you've ever been in a majestic, terrifying storm, you know what the fear of God is. I've been in a couple of hurricanes, one tornado, a couple of events that just, like you probably have, that just make you look and you say, whoa, I don't want to tangle with that. But then you look and you say, whoa, my gosh, what power and what majesty. And the lightning goes across the sky, or the wind's going 120 miles an hour. And it's taking things off roofs and throwing uh, stuff around, cars, whatever. And it's just, there's nothing like it. Our water, we were watching the, from a, up on a mountain, a flood, and a stream broke through, broke a dam, and started just tearing up things in front of it. It's just awe-inspiring, majestic, and like, oh man, I'm glad I'm not in the middle of that. It's both. That's what the fear of God is. It's this awe, majesty, reverence, respect, and then you say, but I don't want to tangle with him. I don't want to tangle with that. There's a fear in the Bible that's healthy. Matter of fact, the Bible says it's the fear that removes all other fears. It's the fear that removes all of the fears. Perfect love casts out fear. It's the fear that heals you, cleanses you, changes you. These people had no fear of God because they feared man. You? How about you? Who do you fear the most? Who do you give the most respect to, the most reverence, listen to the most? That's who you fear. So Jesus is standing there and he's going, to get, he's going to get the worst beating of his life. Things are going to happen. There's going to be problems, right? All kinds of things are going to go, ha going to go happen. And as he's headed to the cross, he stands in front of the people and he says, The Lord has sent me for you. The very people who are going to shout crucify him, he says, That's the people I love. That's the people I love. Father, and pray that someone for the very first time will fear you over others right here in this building. I pray they'll give you authority over their life. As we sing to you just this chorus. And pray that for someone it'll be their first real confession of you. Fathers, we sit quietly for a moment. We pray that you'll hear our repentance for reverencing, loving, respecting people more than you. We repent. Father, thank you that you sent your son for us. The one who is gentle and lowly who changes everything.